Hello, everybody. Uh, so this is going to be another live coding session, sort of continuing on from where we left off working on assignment one um, and sort of translating some of that work through to what we're doing for assignment two. Um, so actually, I'm going to start off and I'm going to show you a, um, a very little skill that um, I hardly thought mattered at first, but um, I think it's actually pretty useful when you're getting started with C++. Um, so, you can see here, I have in this Jeff's A1 demo folder here, um, which contains my solution that I was working on throughout the previous demo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this folder and I'm going to change the names of some of the things in it to assignment 2 and show you how to sort of like get that up and working again because it will kind of do some things that break it um, but this might be helpful to you to be able to sort of like copy things over and and work from like a newly named project uh, I know you're gonna run into this sooner or later and it'll be a helpful skill to have um, so first of all uh, if you wanna take this and turn it into assignment 2 uh, what I'm going to do for mine is I'm just going to copy and paste this. So this is just going to produce like Jeff's A1 demo copy, or at least that's what happens in Windows. And I'm just going to rename that to Jeff's A2 demo. Of course, that's not the only thing that we have to think about here. Um, so if I want to rename all the things to assignment 2, I can just sort of go through the folders here and rename things to be assignment 2. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm just renaming um, the project folder, the solution file, the database file. Go into the project, and sure enough, there are the project files that need to be updated as well. And I guess I don't need this table anymore. You should also be sure to get rid of this debug folder. Uh, that might do weird things when you rename projects like this to, and, and Visual Studio may in fact even warn you about this. So um, it's a thing to pay attention to. So I'm gonna get rid of this, and I'm gonna get rid of this. So um, I'm now left with a project which shows assignment two. So I'm going to open up the solution and the first thing that you're going to notice is that there's immediately going to be an error. Boom. Um, so one or more projects in the solution were not loaded correctly. Um, and that's fine because if you look over in the solution explorer over here, of course, you'll note that Jeff Rowe's assignment one is the project that it's trying to load and that should be no surprise right because the last time we opened this solution it was opening a project that was in a folder called Jeff Rowe's assignment one and it was trying to load that um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove this because this project technically no longer exists we renamed it so what we want to do is just add existing project and then we'll add in the one with the name that we added so we can just so just to be totally clear so I was in Jeff's A2 demo folder I just went into my solution went into my project picked my project file and here you go so that should uh, that should give you all the files that you were sort of looking for before so if I open this up let's try running it I guess and see what we get out of this Yes, let's do it. Okay, so this is basically where we left off from the last demo. So by now, you should probably have something considerably more complete than this, but uh, we're going to talk about a full solution to assignment one maybe a little bit later. Um, for now, I just wanted to put something together that maybe would give you a a head start on dealing with assignment two and kind of knowing where to go with that. So we can sort of build on top of uh, what we have for assignment one to work into assignment two because what assignment two is asking for, and I suppose it wouldn't hurt for me to actually take a quick look at uh, assignment two's let me just pull that file up for you. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, sorry, give me a second. Uh... All right. Oh. Come on, word. You can do it. Sorry, I think my computer is still in the throes of booting up or indexing something or whatever, but it is certainly not running its best. All right, well, anyway, so we have this open now. All right, so in this assignment, um, you're going to have to deal with the motion of a couple of bodies at the same time. And while technically it would be possible to sort of just create a couple of bodies into your main and operate with them in there, uh, we want to introduce another concept that game engines typically deal with, and that is the idea of a world. So we're introducing this GD world class. And basically the main feature of a world is that it keeps track of some number of physics bodies and it keeps track of time. Those are kind of the big items. Um, in this case, we're going to have it also sort of handle uh, how gravity should be accelerating things in the world and how a wind force uh, will be involved that, that acts on objects in the world. Um, those things are kind of optional uh, for a world. It really depends what your game is and what your world ought to do, I suppose, for, for what those things might be. Um, but so, I mean, as you can see, sort of the constructor... Um, when you create a world, you create it with some acceleration due to gravity, you create it with some wind force. Um, when you update the world, so we're going to experience a little bit of a change in the way that we wrote our code from before, because previously when we wanted to make sure that our bodies moved, we updated the bodies individually. It's now sort of going to become the world's job to do this updating. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as we get closer to that. But know that the world is going to kind of take over the responsibility of updating things. Um, so add body and remove body. These functions are really just simply because we have a collection of bodies. We just want to be able to like add one and remove one from the list. And you're going to also note that we are working with pointers in here which we had not previously been doing, so uh, you've probably at least bumped into these in C++ by this time, but uh, you're probably still kind of getting used to it, so I'll try and make sure to uh, make note of any cases where I'm doing any like referencing or dereferencing and sort of point out um, what I'm doing surrounding those things, so... <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, so... The scenario here involves tracking the movement of two bodies with different mass. So one is two kilograms and one is four kilograms. And we're operating within a world that has an acceleration due to gravity of negative 9.8 meters per second. So it's going to accelerate things toward the ground. We're placing both of the bodies at basically 200 meters uh, positive on the y-axis. So we are positioning them so that they have a long way to fall. Uh, one of these, um, okay, yeah, both of these bodies are going to have a thousand newtons applied to them um, in the x direction. So they're going to move to the right assuming right word is what you consider positive x, but that's what I'm considering positive x. And we want to, just like before, sort of print out some useful information about these, which um, follows a table like this. So 
It doesn't contain all the same things that the previous one does, but being able to write out a table to the console and to a file is pretty useful here. Because uh, we want to know what the time is, and we want to know the position of the two, uh, in this case, the X and Y position of object 1, and we want to know the X and Y position um, of object 2, and we want to be able to track those over time. So anyway, um, as we get started here, uh, I just want to uh, dive in and take a quick look at some of the things that may change a little bit here. Actually, give me like two seconds and I will be right back. can't do a good YouTube video without some water. Um, all right, so we are going to uh, be creating a world that takes over some of the responsibility of the, the things that we're dealing with here. Primarily, um, current time and jet ski. I'm just going to pack those together here because these things are kind of going to be subsumed by the body. The body is just going to uh, do the work that these used to do. So, um, that makes a pretty good start. I am going to go into my project. I'm right-clicking on my project. I'm going to add a class. So we're going to add GD body. Er, pardon me. I have a GD body and a GD world. So as usual, we start off with the bare basics. We've got our H file and our CPP file. Um, we may actually find this time around that we want a destructor. Oh, well, this will be a good thing to talk about. Sure. Okay, so what things does our world do? What information does it hold on to? Um, so we had mentioned, of course, that it uh, holds on to the elapsed time. That's one feature that it has. Um, I'm going to make sure to include uh, our vector. Oops include gd back to dot h because it has a vector two for acceleration due to gravity and it also has a gd vec two for uh, wind force now in reality the force due to wind is probably something that is on a per body um it's like a an individual thing to to the body and the aerodynamic profile of the body uh, combined with some other things um in this simulation we're just going to sort of say simply that um the force applied by the wind is the same sort of to everything involved and then lastly um actually i'm going to put something in that we probably don't want to do to start with or the thing that you maybe most naturally feel like we should be doing here. And that would be to, well, we know for sure that we're going to need to include GD body. No. GD body. So, So there's a couple things that we could potentially do here. Um, I could say that we have some array of GD body pointers. How does this go in C++? Yeah, that's how we're going. Okay, so this is one way that I could write this. And I'm going to focus on this one line for a little bit. Is this GD body pointer? 
I, I have here what I've defined as an array of 10 bodies. Now, for the sake of this simulation, given the fact that we really don't need to add or remove more than exactly two, you could get away with doing this. You could hold on to this thing where um, you can simply hold on to two bodies and that's cool. Um, but the point of this making this world isn't just to run this simulation. We want to show you something about how you can put together um, a more general physics world for, for your later assignments and your project. So what I'm going to show you is a new thing from the standard library which you should get used to. Um, I'm going to include vector not to be in uh, not to be confused with things like vector 2 or vector 3 um, what I'm going to write is something a little bit different so unsurprisingly this is also from the standard library so it uses STD vector it uses a triangle bracket here I'm gonna discuss this briefly uh, GD body in there and I'm going to call this bodies for now it's going to complain probably because I have two things by the same name actually I'm surprised that it isn't I'm going to comment this out anyway so what is this thing this is a standard collection um, called vector it is a resizable array type that allows you to sort of add and remove elements um, and it will just like automatically resize the memory required in order to do this. This is most like um, list in C sharp, I think is probably sort of the closest comparison. Um, so if you're familiar with using the list type in C sharp, which you may also remember has this similar sort of triangle bracket notation where you tell it what type of thing uh, it is going to store. So when we say standard vector GD body inside chevrons or triangle brackets like that, we are meaning to say that this is a collection of GD bodies. So it knows that that's the type that it's going to hold on to. Um, when you see things written this way in C sharp, um, this is usually referred to as generics. Um, a generic class is one that takes type arguments inside triangle brackets like this. Um, in C++, you'll often see this referred to as using templating. Um, you may see it referred to as generics at least sometimes, which is also true, um, but um, this is using C++'s templating system. And Interestingly, C++'s templating system can do a lot of powerful things that C sharps can't. Um, but that's a fairly advanced topic. For now, it's good enough to know that um, this is an important collection that uh, is probably going to be useful and interesting to you. Um, I feel like I should probably also just sort of pop open a window here and um, I suggest that you get used to um, kind of searching for um, some of these types that that you're interested in looking up so I'm just gonna do a quick search and kind of go to the first hit for vector uh, so that we can have a quick look at this um, so you're going to get lovely looking documentation pages like this that are fairly cryptic. Um, and you will learn more and more as time goes on how to read this kind of stuff. But it's a thing that you probably want to have some familiarity with. Um, to start with, probably the things that you're most interested in is looking at what member functions something like this has. Um, because vectors use a slightly different terminology than um, C sharps lists do for example they they don't use convenient words like add and remove for example and uh, you're going to quickly discover that there are um, 
there are some weird aspects to using collections in C++. My advice is that you take the plunge and you try to work with this. And I will show you a few of the things about how these work uh, in this video and others. But um, I just want you to recognize that this is going to be a thing that you probably... Uh, you are you are certainly going to need to know how to do uh certainly by the time third year comes around um but probably by the time year two comes around you want to be comfortable with these if possible so in any case so we have our collection of bodies um so that's a thing a world has um we also had from our assignment description which is here um, we had a few functions that uh, we were going to be interested in here, and so I'm just going to copy those in. Uh, I'm going to hold on to this destructor, actually, because uh, we're going to find that that might be actually useful. So let's... Um... Great. Okay, so... Cool. So our .h file is put together as usual. Um, uh, yes, that's true. I'm not going to have a standard constructor for GD World because I want to make sure that the gravity acceleration wind force gets set to start with. Um, so um, as usual, when we get this far, we've got green underlines. And so if you are uh, remembering from last time, that's going to mean that there is no function that matches these. Uh, these that are defined in .h in our .cpp file over here. So at this point, this is where we want to grab these and um, bring them over to this side and uh, go about giving them some braces and All right, um, and then, of course, don't forget to put on the, the scope resolution um, so that it knows that it is pointing to GD World in here. Otherwise, you will have problems. Oh, my mistake. All right, okay, so I'm gonna save this quickly, go look at my .h file. Sure enough, everything is working fine, great. So everything's sorted together there, and we have sort of the big building blocks in here. Um, so I'm just gonna start with um, the, the, oh, actually, I'm gonna rename these to initial. Gravity acceleration and initial wind force. That that feels better. Um, and I'm gonna move that over to here as well. Um, okay. So the constructor uh, is no surprise. We have a couple of vec twos in here for storing that. Um, and so we've got these that are being passed in. So, um. I'm simply going to, I'm going to set gravity acceleration equal to initial gravity acceleration, and I'm going to set uh, wind force equal to initial wind force. Um, and that's really all that needs to, uh, oh no, maybe there's a couple of other things that we might be interested in here. Um, if you'll look carefully, you'll notice that elapsed time is in fact a float. And if you remember from last time, if we don't initialize that floating point value to something, uh, it will surely take on a garbage value number. It will just use whatever was in memory there before. Uh, it won't automatically get set to zero. So let's make sure that that happens because we want the clock to actually start at zero and not like 9.2 times 10 to the 14th power or something completely insane. All right, so that's good, we've got that. I'm gonna talk about this destructor maybe a little bit in a moment. 
um, we'll get there. But for now, I want to take a look at this add body and remove body. Um, because this is where we're sort of delving into what this collection uh, means and how you sort of work with it. And you're going to probably look at me cross-eyed in a moment when I'm like, well, why do you want me to work with this? It looks like a pain in the ass. Um, so um, you'll see. So adding a body is easy, thankfully. Uh, it just uses a really weird function name to accomplish this. Um, so since we have our standard vector as part of this object, so we can just use bodies dot, and that will give us a list of the members that are available here. And uh, looking up and down, you will notice immediately that there isn't anything that stands out as add. Um, there's something called push back that you're interested in. What that means is that you are pushing a new object onto the collection at the back of the collection. So the back of the collection is the most recent sort of additions to. It's the end that you normally add things to. So the front of the collection is like the most, um, like the oldest entries that were added at the first. So that'll be like your index 0, 1, 2 is getting toward the front. And uh, maybe, you know, if you had an array of 10 things, like maybe you're getting to index 9 at the end, and that's the back of the array. So we want to push a body onto the back of the collection. Uh, what is the complaint? Sorry, just give me one sec. Oh, my mistake. Do you see my error here? I mean to be talking about GD body pointers here. So I'm making a collection of GD body pointers that I'm holding on to. You'll note that GD world add body takes a body pointer, and so I want to be able to put the pointer onto this array. So that's where that, uh, that little red squiggle was coming from. So adding is pretty straightforward. Uh, weird function name, pushback is sort of weird. You'll, you'll learn to remember that in time, but that's what it is. Um, and for removing, um, you're gonna find that there isn't really anything around. You're gonna look through this and you're gonna go, well, how do I get one out? And technically, for the sake of this assignment, you could probably get by without having a remove body. You don't really need to be able to do it to accomplish what we want to accomplish during this assignment. But it doesn't hurt to have, like, you know, a growing understanding about how to work with these collection types, because you're going to use them a lot. Um, so if we, um, if we look through this list, the closest thing that we'll find to um, remove is erase. So um, if we look at a race, uh, what it does is it needs to have a position for the thing that it removes. And you go like, oh, I just give it the index. No, I wish things were that easy. Unfortunately, um, you're going to experience a little bit of pain in the process of this. Why there aren't any easy ways to do this is beyond me, but welcome to C++. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce you to something a little bit weird, but you're going to become more and more used to it over time. And once using this clicks, uh, you will have a lot more power in C++ than you did before. So we want to find, uh, where is the find function in amongst all this business? Should be one around here. Oh, my mistake. Okay, so C++ standard find. Uh, find is in fact a separate function that does not belong to a uh, vector. But I'm just gonna look this up so that uh, we can take a quick look at it. Um, so 
find. It finds a value in a range, and it returns an iterator to the first element in that range. Um, an iterator, uh, that's probably a new concept for you. Um, an iterator is like a container that holds on to a whole bunch of, of values and lets you sort of count through them one by one. Um, this is the underlying thing that makes for each loops work, in fact, um, in most languages. Um, but what I want to show you here is that, for example, in this, this code example is probably maybe a good place to start because... Oh, one moment. All right, so here we've got a vector of integers called my vector. Um, and he's also defined this vector of integers iterator called it. Using standard find to basically say go between the beginning of my vector and the end of my vector looking for 30. And now this iterator does not equal end. What that means is if if there are values in the iterator, if the beginning of the iterator is not equal to the end of the iterator, meaning if there's at least one value of 30 that was found, then do this, otherwise do this. So if something was found, then show me the iterator's value, which is this weird dereferenced iterator. Is this confusing? Yes, totally agree. Uh, it's going to take you a little bit before you probably grapple with the concepts enough to be able to write some of this stuff for yourself. But I'm going to show you what I did for remove body here. Again, this is not entirely necessary, but for those of you who really want to like wrap your heads around the concepts and grapple with them, and that should be most of you, you want to have a fight with C++ now while you have the opportunity and it doesn't start, uh, you know, you're not too dependent upon it to do really big assignments and work. Um, we're going to do that. Now, um, yeah, so... <coughs> standard vector, g body, pointer, iterator. Um, so we're going to use standard find. And so we want to go from bodies dot begin. So this begin gets us the iterator to the beginning of the collection. Um, and so again, you're going to have to trust me a little bit on this one. And bodies dot end, and we want to find body. So the third one is the thing that we're actually looking for. Um, and what is the complaint that I'm getting here? Uh, probably my type is off. Oh, my mistake. Maybe I need to include something. Huh. This is not looking like I have to include anything. What's the deal? Okay. I'm actually going to change this the way that I have it in my code. Uh, it may be the source of the problem here. Is that, um... I am using a feature of C++, a newer feature of C++ that was released in C++ 11, uh, coinciding with 2011, um, which allows you to use auto variables. Oh, actually, um, I probably just forgot an obvious part of this. Ha ha ha, yeah, okay. So um, I'll describe that auto variable thing in a moment. I was going to do that anyway. So what I have here is I've got a standard vector of GD body pointers, but I want the iterator for that type. Um, and I have a variable called it. I am using standard find to go from the beginning of the body's collection to the end, looking for a pointer that matches the body that I passed in here. 
So remove body is going to go through the body's collection from start to finish looking for bodies that match the one that I asked for and return me an iterator to each of those hits that it found. Right? Okay. Technically add body, since it's very simple, lets us add more than one of the same, which probably is a bad idea, but it's good enough for now. Um, in any case, this will give us the capability to remove those things. Now, as for that auto business, you'll notice that this type is fairly long. This standard vector, GD body, pointer, iterator. Like, there's a lot there to remember. There's a lot there to type. Um, for iterators um, and dealing with things like collections where you start getting these types that are just long, uh, it can be awfully nice to just write this. You may be familiar with var, for example, um, in JavaScript or in C Sharp, you have the ability to just say var and um, the thing will take on whatever type the value suggests that it would be. Um, C++ now has this capability. You don't have to use it all the time. Um, you can't use it all the time. You do at some level have to explicitly say what types your classes hold, for example. But inside of functions, sometimes when you're just going to receive something back that has a long and awkward type, auto's pretty great. And this is one of those times. So I'm going to use auto here because um, it's just awkward to do otherwise. Um, and uh, I'm going to do basically just what that tutorial was suggesting. I'm just going to say if iterator is not equal bodies dot end. So this is meaning if the iterator contains a matched body, then we want to use that erase function that we mentioned. Yeah, so um, this was all the lead up just to be able to get an iterator that we could pass to the collection type to tell it to erase stuff. That's something else, thanks C++. You know, don't make our lives easy or anything. Um, oh, yeah, my bad. This is a thing that I, I wrote for, for myself in my version. I I had modified this function, this remove body, so that it would... Um, actually, why don't we do that here? That's a little, little bit more useful. Um, so, one piece of advice that I have been given from other more uh, advanced programmers than myself... So, I'm... Before I launch into my story, I should say I am changing remove body to return bool here. So I've just made that change in both of these places. So one piece of advice that I've gotten from more advanced programmers than myself um, is to not waste my returns. Um, you'll note that a lot of the time you write functions with void returns. Um, and really what you're saying there is that when this function runs, it doesn't return any, any information back to me. But there's a lot that you can do with that. And this is a simple example of a case where you might want to return something back. Because when you say, remove this body from the world, it could be helpful to know whether there was a body that matched that got removed or not. And that's basically what's happening here, is that if something matches, we return true to say to the caller, yes, that body that you asked to be removed was removed, and if there was nothing, it says false, I didn't find anything, so I couldn't remove one. And will you use that often? Maybe not, but it gives you information back about how this went or didn't go, um, so that later you can use that information uh, for something if you need to. So it's little things like that um, that can be pretty useful. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so the collection-related stuff uh, is mostly dealt with here, and you know what? I'm going to talk about one more thing before I end this one. Um, I realized that there has not been very many lines of code written for such a long 
session, but I wanted to sort of go over some of these things about how collections and especially iterators work, because iterators are weird. And we're probably going to see a little bit more of those, and believe me, this is not the half of it. You get weirder and weirder things if you ever talk about the standard map type, for example, you'll get really weird stuff. So just wanted to introduce you to that. Um, the last thing that I want to go over is this destructor. Um, so because the world's job is to hold on to these bodies, these are pointers. And when you're dealing with pointers, usually it means that you have a responsibility to delete these objects from memory somewhere. Um, that is not necessarily always true, but it's a fairly good hard and fast rule that if you were holding on to a collection of pointers, that there is a good likelihood that it is your responsibility to clean up after yourself. That somebody will have created this memory and passed it off to you and it is your job to maintain the memory of these bodies so that when the world gets deleted, if the world just gets destroyed and nobody else knows where these bodies are, because I was the one, the world is the one that's holding on to a list of where all these things are in memory, if the world goes away, they're stuck in memory. Nobody knows how to find them anymore, and that's bad news. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that when deleting happens that we go through each of the bodies in the list and just get rid of it, right? Now, this remove body, um, I'm going to make a slight addition to. Um, I'm going to see if this actually even works for me. So, is that going to behave? Okay. So, I'm doing something funky here, right? This dereferencing is uh, pretty strange looking, right? So, let me see if I can, uh, nope, no, oh, that's super weird, that's not going to work nicely. Okay, actually, we're going to talk about this, this thing next time. It's complicated enough that without notes written down, I'm probably just going to make a mess of it. So, I'm going to do that. And um, we'll talk about that the next time that we start off here. All right, well, anyway, thank you for watching this one. Uh, hopefully this helped you along a little bit further. And um, I'll see you in class.